At a news conference today, Northwest Airline officials called the union's bluff, telling its flight attendants to sign or strike. The story just ahead on the 10 p.m. report. WCCO Television presents Pat Myers, Don Shelby, Mike Fairborn, and Mark Rosen. This is the 10 p.m. report. Good evening, everyone. After two weeks of on-again, off-again threats of a strike, Northwest Airlines tells its flight attendants it will impose the unratified contract on April 1st. That action can work in one of two ways. The flight attendants can work under the new agreement or be forced to walk the picket line. But the big question is, will other unions join in? Mike Strand reports. Northwest says customer confusion about a possible strike forced the airline to call the union's bluff. But while rejecting calls for binding arbitration, the company spokesman left the door open to further talks. Our strong preference has been and still remains to settle this dispute at the bargaining table. However, the time has now come for us to exercise our right to homogenize our flight attendant workforce under equal rates of pay, benefits, and working conditions. Northwest says terms of the imposed contract make their flight attendants the second highest paid in the nation. Starting pay would rise to $15,000, phased in over 12 years, to a top scale of about $35,000. But Northwest isn't budging on the key issue blocking an agreement, that being the company's demand to force lower-paid flight attendants to wait eight years instead of five before reaching the highest scales. The, the Teamsters' chief negotiator says Northwest's move is no surprise, but, quote, off the wall. They're on a collision course, and everybody's going to get hurt. What's your best bet as to a strike as of next week? I would say uh, pretty close to 100%. I would say unless somebody uh, gets the people to the bargaining table and the company sees sense, uh, the company is the one that's going to hurt itself, but they used a hard hand. We know best. We know our people. We'll divide and conquer them, and we'll, we'll shove this down their throat. I don't think that can be done. And the escalating test of wills may cause more passengers to bolt to other airlines despite Northwest's move. Yet the company's response leaves the union with three options, strike, sign, or return to the bargaining table. The next move is theirs. Mike Strand of the CCO Television News, Minneapolis. What may be called an olive branch, the company is offering a $2,000 bonus to low-scale flight attendants. But the union calls that an effort to divide its membership. David Lilly, the University of Minnesota's Vice President for Finance, announced late today he will retire on June 30th. The 70-year-old administrator says recent heart trouble was a major factor in his decision. The stinging legislative audit report on Eastcliff was also released today. The report says the cost of renovating the official residence of President Ken Keller went over budget for a number of reasons. One, because Keller and his wife were too closely tied to the project. The report also says the Board of Regents should have asked more questions since it knew the renovation work was underway. And the auditor says new controls need to be put in place to keep closer watch over who is spending how much money. Lawmakers reacted strongly to the audit findings of private bids and a $7 million bank account that some call a slush fund for top university officials. Although they've got a lot of egg on their face, if they don't do something quickly, it's going to be smeared all over their face. Lawmakers say the report is serious, but not serious enough for Ken Keller to resign. Tonight, Keller said the audit confirms what he has said over the past few weeks, that there were procedural errors and that he made errors in judgment. The Minnesota Supreme Court suspended Ramsey District Judge Alberto Miera today until the justices make a final decision on his future. Miera allegedly kissed a male court reporter and engaged in other forms of sexual harassment. Following today's probable cause hearing, the high court banned Miera from the bench temporarily. He could be removed permanently. Murder charges dropped tonight against 34-year-old Edward Thompson. The prosecution says it cannot go forward with the case against him. So Thompson left the courthouse, a free man, after four months in jail. Two witnesses have disappeared, and the key witness refused to testify. Thompson was accused in the May 1987 murder of a Minneapolis man. Police were also interested in Thompson related to the December strangulation of his girlfriend, Felicia Williams. Police say there is no evidence linking him to the murder. Apple Valley Police say a juvenile is suspected of setting the fire to an Apple Valley home last week. It was a total loss valued at $300,000. No one was home at the time of the fire. Bottled water is being shipped into Crooked Lake Elementary School in Andover because the regular water is contaminated with coliform, a bacteria known to cause headaches and diarrhea. 
Chlorine is being added to the well water in hopes of clearing up the problems, but the kids will be to have to use the water coolers in the tests until tests indicate it is safe to drink from the fountains again. Crooked Lake is the second Anoka County school to experience this problem. It happened to a school in East Bethel just last month. For the first time, doctors have successfully used a laser to open a blocked artery to the heart. The first of its kind treatment was performed on a Chaska woman at Methodist Hospital in St. Louis Park. Health and science reporter Tony Vigneri has this report. You realize that this was something Janice Kahn's went into the hospital on Tuesday with chest pains. Doctors found one of her coronary arteries was 90% blocked, severely reducing blood flow to the heart. Using this special laser, the plaque buildup in the artery was vaporized. Janice went home today feeling much better. I've had minimal to no chest pain, none today at all. And I can breathe normally and feel like I'm getting sufficient amount of air. The procedure used on Janice has been done before in arteries in the leg, but never near the heart. So we inflate a balloon, center it, dispense the light on the disease, vaporize it, cool it with material, go through with the balloon and dilate it, and the vessels open. The technique was developed by GV Medical of Plymouth. While doctors are satisfied that the procedure worked, they remain cautious. It's one of those things that before you can walk, you have to crawl, and I think we're in the crawling stage, to be honestly truthful. With the success of this first procedure, doctors here plan to use the laser treatment on other patients. And if future test cases are as successful, it would certainly open the door for a safe and effective way to treat millions of people with heart disease. Tony McNary, WCCO Television News, St. Louis Park. The laser procedure costs about half that of regular bypass surgery. GV Medical says it expects to conduct further tests with the laser treatment over the next two years. The Soviet news agency TASS reports that the attempted hijacking of an Aeroflot jet has been thwarted and all the would-be hijackers have been killed along with a flight attendant and three passengers. The armed men had apparently been hoping to flee the country. A stretch of the Indiana-Kentucky border is littered with debris from two Army choppers that crashed during a late-night training mission near Fort Campbell, killing 17 soldiers. The choppers involved are Blackhawks, a model that's been involved in eight serious accidents since it was introduced. The fallout from Super Tuesday continues tonight. A Denver television station reports that Gary Hart will drop out of the Democratic presidential race. KUSA Television says Hart was told, has told rather campaign workers he is giving up and a Friday news conference is scheduled. Aides to Republican presidential hopeful Jack Kemp says he'll pull his hat out of the ring tomorrow. The New York congressman finished dead last in yesterday's primaries and caucuses. George Bush might be the happiest candidate tonight. He won in 16 states yesterday and plans to move on to Illinois in full stride. There was a meeting of the mayors tonight in St. Paul. Mayor George Latimer and Minneapolis Mayor Don Frazier spoke with the mayors of 40 metro area communities and with the city leaders of Duluth and Superior. They talked about the Twin Cities bid for the 1996 Summer Olympic Games and they asked the cities for their support. They did not ask for money, however, only for letters and phone calls to persuade the Olympic Committee to bring the games right here. It's been a long road to the Minnesota State Hockey Tournament and tonight the stage is set for what will prove to be three days of peak emotion. WCCO Television is all set to bring you 11 games beginning tomorrow at noon. Everything is in place. Lights, the camera. All we're waiting for now is the action. So join us tomorrow for the Minnesota State Hockey Tournament. We've got a rinkside seat waiting for you. Tonight in Dimension, we focus on issues relating to our day at the office. One being a new trend toward romance in the workplace. But first, the Minnesota legislature is considering a bill to study a problem that's afflicting a growing number of Twin Cities office workers. The problem is eye strain, and it is caused by working with computer screens or video display terminals. For the estimated 15 million Americans who use them, the long hours of staring at the screen can create some problems. Some workers' groups charge it causes migraine headaches, miscarriages, and permanent eye damage. The National Institute of Occupational Safety says there's no evidence to support these claims. Mike Walsher brings us a clearer picture of this problem in his Dimension Report. This is what thousands of Twin Cityans do for a living. They scan a video display terminal. They refine tiny letters on the screen, hour after hour. This woman remembers what a year of that did to her. Just, um, just headaches behind the eyes that don't go away with a couple of aspirin that you can take in the middle afternoon. You have to 
take a complete break and close your eyes and um, relax completely before it'll go away. Since the advent of more and more use of computer terminals, I hear a great deal about patients having problems with them. Problems like headaches, dry eyes, fuzzy vision, and physical fatigue. Dr. Hansen says the symptoms occur because it's harder on the eyes to read a video screen than a printed page. There are colored lights shining at you, and it's a much more intense type of stimulus to the eye versus a printed piece of paper. Many people who work on video terminals wear the traditional bifocals. They allow you to focus on objects at long range and those at reading distance. But some doctors say if you use these screens, you may need glasses with a third focal length. That allows the eyes to focus at arm's length, the distance you'd sit from a video screen. Lynn Bjorkman got glasses after months of headaches and squinting. She claims she's not bitter about it. We're living in a world where computers and computer-generated reports are just a fact of life. And more cases of eye strain are becoming a bigger fact of life, too. I'm Mike Walcher, WCCO Television News, The Twin Cities. The number of Americans using video display terminals is expected to increase to 40 million by the year 2000. Next in Dimension, we turn to a relatively new issue of romance in the workplace. A new study shows the office to be the number one spot for meeting one's future spouse, replacing the more traditional school, church, and parties. But this change is causing some new wrinkles. A new study conducted by the Bureau of National Affairs, so to speak, found that a romantic relationship between a supervisor and subordinate can severely disrupt the workplace. It found that most corporations, though, have no formal policies discouraging romances at the office, although some have policies against married couples working together. Whether corporations are ready or not, it does appear romance in the office has become a fact of life. Business reporter Alan Cox has more in his Dimension Report. They started by sharing an office at a travel agency. Three years later, Richard Noyes got a promotion, vice president, giving sales leads to his staff, thereby influencing the money they earned. One of his underlings was his wife-to-be, Ellie. That was a disadvantage because we had to work awfully hard not to show, for he had to work hard not to show favoritism and to keep everything with the other salespeople very even. She probably wound up at a disadvantage against the other salespeople. And if he didn't give me the good ones, I'd go home and be mad at him. So he really had to figure out a way around this. Eventually, they left the firm on their own to open another travel agency. But corporations struggle to come to grips with modern romance office style. The traditional approach toward office romances has been to outlaw them. More than half the companies in a recent survey said they had policies against nepotism, either formal rules or informal ones. But some of those policies have come under attack in lawsuits. A management consultant says at small businesses, rules may not be as important as a message from the boss to workers who started a romance. It's not that if you, if you have a relationship with someone, it's going to uh, ruin your career, but manage your relationship with that person. Be discreet. Don't let it interfere with your good judgment. Don't let it interfere with your own networking. Don't let it interfere with... Um, how you manage your time. The noise are their own bosses now, but they keep a hectic pace with one child here and one on the way. Weekends when we're home, we try very hard to just leave work at home. And if we have to work on the weekends, we come to the office and do it and go home again and have our family life. And occasionally the owners may disagree. We can't let that be public knowledge. We can't put our employees in the position of, of the discomfort of seeing the two owners uh, not speaking to one another. <laughs> Should some of their employees ever develop an office romance, the noise intend to offer standard advice. At work, keep it professional. Alan Cox, WCCO Television News, Edina. And one last note about office love stories. They received mixed reviews from co-workers. A recent Gallup poll showed 47% of those surveyed approved of unmarried co-workers having an intimate relationship. 39% disapproved. Those against believe that romance creates anger and awkwardness on the job. But they overwhelmingly defend the right of a married couple to hold jobs at the same company. Well, we heard rumors of 
cold and snow. <laughs> it's going to be slow coming, though. I think uh, there's been some rumors out ahead of the storm, and I think that maybe late Friday night into Saturday is our best chance of getting something. We were 50 degrees again today. Oh, it's beautiful. So, yeah, it really was. Going to leave you with a couple more, start out with a couple more tornado tips okay. for you today. If you live in one of these, uh, just remember they are no match for tornadoes. They just are large targets for the winds. And if you live in a mobile home or a trailer home, you should abandon it when the sirens go off. Also, I think most people think, sirens go off, I'm going to get to my car. Well, don't do that. If you're in a shopping area, go to a designated shelter area. This is what happens to uh, parking lots when the uh, winds strike. Cars are just large targets also for the winds, and they tumble and turn. And so if you live in a mobile home or if you're in your vehicle, abandon it for more substantial shelter. It doesn't make any difference what's causing that vehicle to roll and bust the windows out. You're going to get injured. Frightening statistic, too. Uh, the Wichita Falls tornado of 1979 to drive this home, 56% of the deaths reported from that tornado were from people who stayed in their automobiles. It would be hard to climb out of your car dressed up in a suit or anything else and climb in a ditch, but that's the safest thing to do, okay, when, when and if a tornado strikes. Highs today, while well, it was summertime out in North Dakota, uh, several stations out there reported record highs for today as they warmed into the 60s. We had 50s into the southwestern edge of the state and 50 degrees here in the Twin Cities as well. A lot of war excuse me, a lot of warm air ahead of that system, a lot of cold air behind it, and it's that that's creating the threat, at least, of some snow here later on in the week. High temperature today, 50, 33 for an overnight low. Again, the lows are running about what the average high is for this date. No precipitation in the past 24 hours. Satellite picture shows still a lot of clouds in the southeast. They've been getting a lot of rain throughout the eastern part of the country now all week long. Some high clouds moving into us. And here's where the storm's developing, out here in the uh, Nevada area. And the path it takes over the next couple of days is really going to determine and affect our weather here in the upper Midwest. Right now, it looks like we're going to stay on the warm side of things with a lot of warm air coming northward ahead of this thing. So clouds will increase tomorrow. There's the one that uh, we're going to be watching, though. If enough cold air gets into that and it comes at us, it looks like we could get some snow here late Friday night and into Saturday, maybe even lingering on into Sunday. Our high temperatures for tomorrow, though, are going to be on the mild side again. we we'll back up in the 50s. It could be the warmest day so far this year. We may see low 50s here in the Twin Cities and then watch for uh, more bad weather to come in. They already have a couple of uh, winter storm watches in effect for South Dakota for tomorrow night and into Friday. Clear outside right now, 38 degrees, 40, 64 percent humidity. Winds out of the southwest, light two miles an hour, a dew point of 27. The barometer is uh, 29.85 and rising. So clear and mild tonight. We could drop to 32, which would be the first time in about 100 hours that we've seen uh, temperatures at freezing. Tomorrow it'll be partly sunny, windy, and warmer with 53 degrees, what we're forecasting. Southeast winds, though, 15 to 30 miles an hour. Uh, cloudy with occasional showers then tomorrow night, and it'll continue windy with a chance of some showers on Friday, 45 degrees. Then Saturday, late Friday night into Saturday, a chance of some snow, maybe lingering into early Sunday, cooling off and clearing up the first part of next week. Don? Or Pat? Thank you, Mike. A number of local school children had a chance to learn lessons outside the classroom today. Youngsters at Meadowbrook School in Golden Valley took a look at the golden colors of the first flowers of spring some golden crocus that first bloomed on the last day of February. It was a chance to walk in someone else's shoes. The students at Clear Springs School in Minnetonka where able-bodied children experienced what recreation would be like if they were handicapped. And at the Sharing and Caring Hand Shelter in Minneapolis, the Sharing and Caring Hands belong to sixth graders from St. Martin's School of Rogers who not only helped serve the noon meal, they paid for the food. The sports report is next, but first this Minnesota food share reminder. Tom Hanneman is standing by at the St. Paul Civic Center where uh, he's getting ready to report some hockey, but we've got other sports tonight as well, don't we, Tom? We do indeed. This, of course, will be the center of attention starting at noon tomorrow as uh, Channel 4 begins televising the 88 hockey tournament. But tonight, the lead story has to center around the strikers. Uh, they've been having their problems, as you know, on the road. They've won 11 straight at home, but uh, no luck this evening. Uh, tonight they gave it their best shot against again, against Dallas, but uh, fell short by a goal, losing 5-4. to four. Strikers were optimistic after jumping out to a 2-0 lead. Mike Sweeney's goal wasn't a strong shot, but it was perfectly placed. But the Strikers were once again unable to hold on to a lead. Dallas scored five times in the second half to steal a 5-4 win. Mark Carpum nutted the uh, game winner for the sidekick. Strikers are now 6-14 and 14 on the road, and that could mean trouble. Uh, six of their next eight games will be on the road. 
Well, the North Stars today named uh, Lou Nanny their new team president. Louis, of course, resigned uh, his post as general manager just six weeks ago. Louis could do little to help the struggling Stars tonight against Buffalo. Dino Cesarelli uh, did put Minnesota up 1-0 with his first period goal, but that was about it. The Sabres rattled off four straight then, the fourth goal courtesy of Bill Housley. Amazingly, uh, the Stars still have a shot at the playoffs. It's been a, a rough year. I guess don't, I don't need to tell you that. Buffalo beats in the night final. Six to two. Things are quiet here, as we say, at the uh, Civic Center, but uh, this joint will be jumping tomorrow, starting at noon when we kick things off for this state high school hockey tournament. Rochester John Marshall uh, closed out the practice session this afternoon with a short workout. The Rockets are considered one of the favorites in this year's event by many, and a large contingent of their fans expected here tomorrow. In the meantime, John Marshall is ready to go. Today, and the kids really feel that we owe those fans something, and we want to come up here and to show the people in the Twin Cities area and all in the state that we have great fan support. We want to win that sportsmanship award. That's their duty now to win that one. The state basketball tournament's now also around the corner. The girls is next week, the boys the following week. One team to watch for the boys uh, is St. Paul Central. It seems the Minutemen are always a team to watch in this tournament. Andre Thompson and his teammates tore up St. Paul Johnson tonight. Thompson scored at will in the first half. Central scored at will throughout. They beat the Governors. Listen to this final, 103 to 39. Twins split up their squad today and came away with a pair of wins in Florida. Uh, they beat one team traveled to Lakeland. They beat Detroit 10 to 7. The other half stayed at home in Orlando and edged Kansas City 6 to 5. Well, it's no secret when you win a world championship, the stock of your team goes up. So do the value of your baseball cards. If it's a picture of a Minnesota twin, that is. Locally, last year's success a catapulted the demand for twins, and in particular, one special twin. Kirby Puckett. How come? He's the best. Kirby Puckett. How come? Because he's good. I'll be Kirby Puckett or Ken Herbeck. Most famous is Kirby. His card's worth the most out of everybody. But Bio and Ken Herbeck's cards are both going up. Yeah. Kirby, Kirby, Kirby. Well, the Twins' cards may not have the numbers of, say, a Pete Rose rookie card, which sells for $425,000, but uh, they are more popular than last year's. Well over 1,000, probably 1,500 twin sets alone this year. Uh, in a national market, they're not worth a lot, but like I said, around here, they can <laughs> put your own price tag on those little amounts to. I'll tell you what, for a 7, 8, 9, 10-year-old, they're worth their weight in gold. Believe me, any of the Twins cards uh, last year and this year. That is it from the Civic Center, Pat. We'll be here again at noon tomorrow. Send it back to you. Got your cot ready out there, huh? Yes, indeed. Okay, thanks, Tom. <laughs> now, up next, Irish tenors try their best to sing their worst.